Hi, good morning, and welcome to the Fall MRS Workshop Symposium. My name is Imogen Grewal, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Merced, sorry, University of California Merced. I'm a graduate student who has seen the effects of COVID-19 has had in academia, and much of it for this reason, we have decided to facilitate MRS resources to shed light on such a topic. I am, for this event, this is one part of three in which we are hoping to increase awareness and wellness in academia. You will also find with this topic much help with many of the things that you are dealing with currently, such as with COVID-19 in this specific topic. There are also polling as well that you guys can answer at your own discretion at some point in, during this talk. I would also like to introduce our speaker as of now. I am excited to introduce our incredible speaker for this event, Professor Yvette Flores of UC Davis. Dr. Flores completed a doctoral degree in clinical psychology at UC Berkeley in 1982. She has done postdoctoral work in health psychology. Her research focus has been substance abuse treatment outcomes, women's mental health, intimate partner violence, and to mental health and infant men. A professor of psychology and Chicano studies at UC Davis for the past 31 years, Dr. Flores' publications reflect her life's work of bringing community and clinical psychology and Chicano slash Latino studies as she foregrounds gender, ethnicity, sexualities in her clinical teaching and research practice. Her, perk, her book, Chicana and, and Chicano, Mental health, Alma, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Alma Mente y Corazon, was published by the University of Arizona Press in March of 2013, and Psychological Perspective for Chicano and Latino Families was published by Cognitive Academic Publishers in 2014. Sineta Academia Publishers published her ebook on Atlantics, Children and Adolescents in 2016. Her latest book. Cultura in the Corazon, a, a decolonial method for community engaged research, was published by the University of Arizona Press in 2020. Dr. Flores is a national and international consultant on cultural humility, prevention, and treatment of trauma, gender, migration, and mental health and self care for advocates of color. She has also more recently provided talks regarding COVID-19 to which many have praised. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Yvette Flores. Thank you very much, Ms. Grewal. First and foremost, I want to appreciate all of the organizers of this panel who have so graciously invited me to share with you some of what I've learned in the last nine months, which has been extremely challenging for all of us. I would like to foreground the fact that I am particularly appreciative of joining you this morning from cold and sunny California in this virtual space, which is one of the positives of this very traumatic time that we have all endured since the beginning of the pandemic. One of the experiences I have had in the last five years, which I think has prepared me to have this conversation with you this morning, is that I was a co-investigator in an NSF grant to an advanced grant to increase the participation of Latinas in STEM on our campus. As an institutional transformation grant, it brought together a team of scholars. And I, along with a graduate student, now a doctor of education on our campus and a sociologist, led the social science research initiative of this particular grant, the goal of which was to identify and address the barriers that women in general, but Latinas in particular, experienced as they navigated their graduate education in 
diverse fields of STEM. And in another aspect of the grant was to interview the newly hired faculty that came to our campus as a result of this in initiative. And so a lot of what I'm saying today that pertains to your experience as STEM scholars derives from my four or five years of getting to know amazing women who had varying degrees of trauma uh, in their educational trajectory and who chose our campus at the time in which they did, having had multiple offers from various universities because of some of the gender sensitive policies that our campus has, including um, a, a terrific life balance initiative, as well as welcoming women who had the intention of being mothers or who were mothers. And so what I would like to do this morning is to begin again by acknowledging what you're hearing from everyone, but I think it's important to restate, we are not in normal times. And a scientist in particular, it's been my experience, you experience inordinate amounts of pressure to excel, not just to perform, to excel and to thrive. And not all academic institutions are as amicable to diverse faculty, to women who are parents, to women who want to parent, to non-binary individuals, to men who want to father, and so each of us has our own particular set of experiences that makes us unique. And at various points, I will be asking you to reflect on some questions. And at, later on, we're gonna incorporate some of the responses that you have to the polls. And at the end, during the Q&A, if you would like to share some experiences that are triggered, if you will, by, by my talk, I would welcome that. And I also want to caveat that this is a difficult topic. I try to keep it light, but it is a difficult topic nonetheless. And so we may be triggered. And so if you need to step away and if you need to take a short break, get some water, get some tea, feel free to do so. Okay, let's begin. A long introduction, let's begin. So what do I hope um, from this presentation? To address some of the challenges faced particularly by early career, as well as senior faculty who are often forgotten because we too have stress during the pandemic and to bring to light some personal strategies that might help us continue to fulfill the multiple tasks of the professorate. And also to address particular challenges that graduate students and academic staff face because we're all in this together as we keep hearing and we keep stating. If we can go to the next slide, please. And beginning with the obvious, the global pandemic has affected millions worldwide. It also has uncovered the health disparities that disproportionately affect communities of color, immigrants without status, first responders, and those deemed essential service providers. It also has affected educators, students, administrators, and all of those who endeavor to guide, to teach, to mentor, to produce knowledge through research and writing. The impact on graduate students and international scholars has received less attention. Nevertheless, it is critical that we also consider what their particular experience is and what needs they may have. We also know that globally, the government response to the pandemic has varied. And also the institutional responses to academics, scholars, graduate students, staff also has been varied. And each of you knows what your experience is. And I'm certain it's not unique. If we actually had the time to sit in a room together and share our particular experiences, something that psychologists do a lot, we would probably find a lot of commonality, but there are also important differences that I hope you feel welcomed 
as you are invited to share those with us later. Next, please. So we know from social science researchers and epidemiologists and government officials that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a major impact on the mental health of the population. There were documented increased rates of anxiety and depression, increased substance use, possible misuse, abuse, the risk of relapse for those who are in recovery, increased family conflict that people are sheltering in place and experiencing the stressors of reduced employment or pressures to continue to produce at a rate which is not feasible during these times, which results in higher rates of intimate partner violence, child and elder maltreatment. There is also increased isolation for some, particular older individuals, for single mothers, an increased reliance on social media, which can be problematic. At the same time, we're experiencing a greater need for contact and connection. I don't know about you, but I'm getting messages from people I haven't talked to in years. We seem to be reaching out across cyberspace to feel connected to others who are also struggling as we may be. For some, it's been an opportunity to learn new things. It's also given us an opportunity to slow down and to try to find joy in the moment. And these two, these last two, are particularly challenging for academics. We have not been trained to slow down. In fact, most of us have been trained to speed up and to do more and more and more and more. And being unable to perform at the rate to which we are accustomed or that we feel we need to has become a tremendous source of stress, a tremendous source of anxiety for many of us. And I find that this is particularly so for graduate students who are looking at data collection, who are looking at, I have to finish my dissertation. For international students, my visa is contingent on my doing what I need to be doing. These are added stressors that many of us who have the privilege of tenure, who have the privilege of status as residents or as citizens of the United States don't have to worry about. So I hope that as we proceed in the next half hour or so, we can think about how do we find joy in the moment. Next one, please. During this time, we also may be experiencing fear, anxiety, isolation, the illness of friends, colleagues, loved ones, the deaths of important people. I have lost colleagues the loss of income and financial worries, disruption to our research and other scholarly activities. Our history of trauma may be triggered. We may feel uncertain about our future. And certainly, I think probably all of us are worried about the impact of the pandemic on our careers. Are we going to progress as we had hoped? Are we going to be able to publish what we need to publish this year? When is my next merit review? When is my next evaluation? When is my next grant due? Can we produce? Can we write? Can we research at the same level? Many of us can, many of us cannot. I find that I make a list of five things to get done in a day. And if I accomplish two, I congratulate myself. And the next day I begin again. And there are some things that are just not going to get done. And I need to give myself permission to do so. Next one, please. So what has been the impact on all of you as STEM scholars? I invite you to think about this and feel free to share at the end during the Q&A or in the chat. Um, how has the pandemic affected your life, your scholarship in particular, your research production, your teaching, your mentoring? your emotional well-being. How have you coped? As I said, I'm finding that personally, and I think it's important to be authentic and transparent when talking about these topics, that I'm inundated with letters of recommendation, several of which I do today, and several of which I do tomorrow. And 
I find that I literally have to force myself to sit in front of the computer. I'm getting crisis emails from students. I'm getting crisis calls triaged from our department uh, manager saying, this student is in crisis. Can you talk to them? I'm the psychologist. Some students don't want to uh, reach out to mental health services because of um, the stigma associated to seeking mental health for many of us who don't come from cultures where speaking to a psychologist is a normal quote unquote thing. Next uh, slide, please. Prior to speaking with you this morning, I reached out to several of the STEM scholars on my campus that I got to know well uh, through the research. And I asked them, after checking in, seeing how they're doing, et cetera, um, if they would be willing to share some of the significant impacts that they're experiencing on their ability to work. And this is a summary of what the majority of them said. It's not a scientifically drawn sample. This is qualitative, not quantitative. But the majority of the STEM scholars I spoke with said the biggest challenge has been to doing field work, to be able to collect the data, that some of them for quite some time had a limited access to the labs when the campus shut down. And at the same time, they were facing expectations from supervisors, from lab managers, from department chairs, from deans, continue, to continue the research despite high rates of virus transmission. Our campus right now is fairly shut down. And prior to coming to campus, everybody has to fill out a survey where we identify whether or not we have had symptoms. Our campus now is offering testing. All the buildings are shut down. You have to have a key to come in and getting a key to a building is uh, not, not an easy process. So for undergraduates in particular, but also for graduate students, it may be very challenging to get into their building, to get into their lab. For those of us who are dependent on grants, there may be financial pressures, uh, given some of the government changes in the recent past about whether or not we could use certain language. Uh, words like diversity in our grants might also be a source of stress. Many of the scholars felt that they had limited social supports that oftentimes families and peer systems who are not scientists don't truly understand the nature of the work. And as a result, they assume that we're all getting home, drawing, uh, we're all staying home, drawing a paycheck and doing nothing. And this produces anxiety and it produces some degree of guilt because we have the privilege, many of us, to work from home, to sit in our offices in front of a computer and continue to do what we do, at least some of the teaching and some of the mentoring, the letter writing, for example, but we can get in the field. The communities in which I work in the Central Valley of California, I have not been able to visit since March. And Many of the people with whom I work are farm workers. They don't have access to technology. They don't have Zoom. They don't have computers at home. The children may have computers to do their distance learning, but they, they don't have the experience of, of virtually connecting to people. So for me, one of the biggest losses has been not to be able to go to the communities where I do research. For those of us who are parents, in my case, grandparent, um, Having to continue acad academic duties while supporting children's distance learning. And my daughter is a nurse. Um, she's got four children ranging in age from 20 to seven, all of whom are doing distance learning. It takes, it takes a village. She's had to take leave from work. Um, by now, the older children are very much accustomed to doing their own thing, but the first grader needs a lot of support to actually focus uh, on Zoom, which no seventh grader, no first grader um, should have to. Next one, please. The impacts that I have just listed may, may differ for graduate students, for early career scholars, for international students. Given the hierarchical nature of the academy, some of us may be able to access more resources than others from the university. 
um, I certainly could request another computer to work from home to replace the 10 year old desktop that I have and that often decides not to work. But graduate students may not have the same access. Uh, certainly undergraduates are struggling to keep up with their work and particularly those in the sciences are having a very difficult time. And many of the undergrads are thinking about trying to get that research done so that they can apply, apply to graduate school. So there's a great deal of stress across the board. I'd also like you to consider uh, sharing later how your academic institution or place of work has responded to the pandemic and whether or not you feel supported by your institution. I feel very supported. I feel very fortunate. Yet there's nothing they can do about my being able to go to the communities where I do research. So if you rule the world and um, it's time for us to use our voice, what specific recommendations would you have to improve the quality of your work life during this time? It is not clear how much longer we will need to be in this state of suspended animation, trying to work under the current circumstances. So I think it's important. And also in terms of the future and future pandemics we will encounter, how do we need to adjust how we work? How do we, or do we need to change the science culture to respond to challenges such as the ones that we're currently facing? Next slide, Simi, please. And now having painted this gloomy picture, I'd like to focus a little bit on coping and self-care. So what are you doing to get by? Again, it is important to remember that life has changed for all of us. We cannot perform at the same level as before when our sense of safety, security, and the familiar has been irre irrevocably changed. We have to acknowledge the reality we live in and we must focus on self-care. In my experience, academics, uh, particularly those who are older as myself, have not really had a culture of self-care. I think a lot of my junior colleagues, um, a lot of the women and men that we recruited out of our STEM initiative funded by the NSF grant are much better at least at thinking about the importance of self-care. In the interviews we did of 53 STEM scholars of various disciplines, the majority of them uh, reported having a practice, exercise, yoga, meditation, um, about half reported having used therapy psychotherapy, to deal with life challenges, to deal with the pressures of academia, to deal with interpersonal, intrafamilial kinds of conflicts. Mm -hmm. The older scholars that we interviewed, full professors, um, women who did not go into academia because their graduate school experiences were so toxic, they went into industry. Um, the majority of them disclose that they really have not uh, learned how to prioritize themselves during the graduate school, that they focused on their studies, they focus on their achievements, they focus on getting ready for the job talk, na navigating tenure, navigating promotion to full professor, getting the next grant, and as time allowed, they would do things for themselves, but that they worked 50, 60, 70 hours a week. We can't do that during a pandemic. And so we need to identify ways in which we can have a more balanced life. Easier said than done. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about emotional self-care. 
which are the actions designed to maintain balance in our lives in order to realize and complete the tasks, the routines, and or goals before us. And this is so we can have tranquility and satisfaction with our life. Emotional self-care is crucial. I think many of us um, are more in tune with physical self-care, getting enough sleep, balanced meals, remaining hydrated, exercising, but we often pay less attention to our emotional self-care. As I mentioned earlier, rates of anxiety and depression have increased during the pandemic. What are we doing to soothe ourselves, to reduce the symptoms, to understand why we're feeling what we're feeling? And again, I want to underscore the fact that feeling anxious, feeling sad, teetering on depression during the last nine months is normal. We would have to be totally disconnected and dissociated from reality to not have some degree of anxiety, some degree of sadness. We are facing tremendous uncertainty. So given that, we need to focus on our emotional self-care. Next slide, please. So let's talk a minute about our emotions. These are expressions of how we feel. Our emotions begin in our thoughts and our ideas. They also begin in our neurobiology. And so those of us who have a history of trauma may be feeling more intensely our emotions. I don't know about you, but I'm crying at commercials. Uh, I see a puppy, I start tearing up and I just smile and say, yeah, you're feeling it, it's okay. However, our emotional state may be reflected in our actions. In other words, ideas, we begin in our thoughts, which may begin in a neurobiology, manifest as emotions and in turn affect our behavior. So we can work backwards. What am I doing? And if you watch the news, you hear all this focus on the pandemic, Overeating, the pandemic over drinking, the sh over shopping. I don't know, Jeff Bezos doesn't need, doesn't need any more money, but we keep buying things from Amazon that we may or may not need. So many of us are engaging in behaviors that if we look back, we can identify that maybe they are connected to how we're thinking, how we're feeling in the moment. Studies have been done that sometimes individuals who are diagnosed with an incurable illness um, start traveling, start running up the credit card, start buying things that they may never wear. Um, and so perhaps this over shopping, over eating, over drinking that some of us are doing is reflective of the sense of gloom and doom and this fear that we also may succumb to the virus, regardless of how much we protect ourselves. So that our emotions and our behaviors are expressions of how we feel. Understanding this is important because we can intervene and try to break that chain at any point. We can try to adjust our behaviors or substitute our behaviors for other behaviors that are, might be more health promoting and less expensive. Uh, we can deal with our emotions. We can try to change our thoughts. Any of these are particular ways that might be helpful at one time or another in how we respond to the stress of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So how do we maintain our emotional health? Again, each person has their own diverse way of promoting and maintaining emotional health. For some of us, breathing, doing breathing exercises, remaining hydrated, good nutrition, getting enough sleep, meditating, connecting to others, 
reflecting on the positive things in our life, showing gratitude are important ways. For many of us, particularly those of us who come from very collectivist cultures where the group, the clan, the family is very important, maintaining connection can be a lifesaver, literally. Sometimes by celebrating our culture and the positive things in our culture, what we have learned in our families, and also establishing new traditions. Something that my family began to do, as many others have in the early phase of the pandemic, was uh, doing puzzles together. This thousand piece puzzles that my daughter, her husband and children all of whom live with me, uh, were doing every night. They were gathering together around the table and working on a puzzle, getting away from screen time, sharing time together, playing Monopoly, playing Scrabble, um, trying to teach the six-year-old at the time how to play Scrabble. These became new traditions, things that the family really had done together because of everybody's work schedule. And now everybody was home. Next slide, please. So you can think about the ways in which you can establish new traditions. Cooking together is something that a lot of people have begun to do. In the midst of all of this, many of us are beginning to experience emotional fatigue. If we hadn't before, most of us as the holidays approach, we just past the Thanksgiving holiday and millions of people did not heed the advice of public health scholars and traveled by car, by train, by plane. And probably because of emotional and mental fatigue. Emotional fatigue is a concept that describes the state of exhaustion, lack of motivation or desire or enjoyment that gets in the way of meeting our goals, our expectations, and obligations and can result in low mood. Nine months into the pandemic, I think the majority of people in this country and likely around the world are experiencing emotional fatigue. My co-investigators in Mexico are really struggling. And particularly many of the scholars because in a way, uh, unlike the United States, many universities in Latin America um, don't have the resources to actually pay the salary of faculty who are not teaching or who are not on campus. And so the emotional pressures add to emotional fatigue. But also there is mental fatigue. Many of us may be feeling oversaturated or overstimulated, which leads to feeling overwhelmed and blocks, blocks us from our daily routine. I think for many of us, um, the election added to mental fatigue, the never ending um, issue of whether or not um, we had safe elections adds to this burden. And I think particularly for people who know science, follow science and respect science, both emotional and mental fatigue has been exacerbated by anti-science sentiments that we have observed in the last few years and certainly in the last few months and particularly during the pandemic. Certainly my epidemiologist friends are at their wits end by the ways in which people are refusing to heed the messages from epidemiologists about how to protect ourselves and protect each other. It is important that we recognize that we may be experiencing emotional and mental fatigue and that again, it is normal. It's nothing to beat ourselves up about. It's nothing to be ashamed about. It is normal. And many of us may be extremely resilient and very optimistic people who are not experiencing high degrees or emotional or mental fatigue. Let us not judge them. Let us celebrate them. Maybe they can share with us some of their optimism for when we're feeling down. Next slide, please. So what can we do? Here we go, come to the practical part. 
the psychologist, practicing clinician in me wants to give advice. So please forgive me. I'm going to be telling you what you can do that you probably already are doing it. But if not, you might consider incorporating this. I invite you to recognize your fears. I think it's important to recognize our fears. Don't reject them. Learn to understand them. I have an advanced directive, very clear. My daughter has power of health decisions for me. And around April of this year, I said, I do want to be put on a ventilator. I'm not ready to die. Because I have one of those advanced directors of do nothing. Okay. I never thought I would be afraid of dying, but I have to recognize that, yeah, I don't want to die that way. I'd like to die old in my bed or in a hammock in the Caribbean, but I don't want to die not being able to breathe. I have underlying conditions. I'm a high risk individual. I have asthma. So I know what it's like to not be able to breathe. So, okay, I can understand that fear. And yeah, I don't want to be put on a ventilator if it comes to that. What is the source of the anxiety? What is the source of the anxiety I might be feeling in any given moment? This morning, my anxiety was elevated because this is a new platform. And I didn't know how many scientists I was going to be speaking to. And as a psychologist, we've always had an inferiority complex, being told over and over again that we're not real scientists, that we're pseudoscientists. I always feel a little uh, of the imposter syndrome when I'm speaking to scientists, and thank goodness I cannot see your faces, I would be even more anxious. I think it's important, and I say this to everybody, I'm not in particularly directing it at you scientists, but I think it's important to not accept information without corroborating its origin or veracity. And so if you hear that the campus is doing this or that, and I think particularly for those of us who are early career or graduate students, sometimes the information comes to us through third or fourth sources. Take a breath, check with your PI, check with your dissertation director or chair and say, okay, I heard this, is it true? Do not succumb to anxiety without having all the facts. This is, I think, easier for scientists to do. You are used to checking out the facts. But something that I find very helpful and that the STEM scientists shared with me that is helpful for them is to begin the day with a positive affirmation. <sighs> Blessed be, I woke up, I can breathe today. I don't have a fever, I'm not coughing. My family's healthy. I have a roof over my head. I still have a job, I can work from home. Maintain a group of friends with whom we can share our worries. It's okay to have complaining sessions and coping sessions. And at bed bedtime, identify three positive things that occur during the day. It's important to begin and end the day with this bookends of positivity, to recognize that we may have experienced and do levels of stress, or perhaps today was an easier day than yesterday. Perhaps I took Sunday off and it's okay because these are not normal times. Next slide, please. But I also would like us to draw attention to ourselves, to our history. I know we have a very diverse audience. I know that scientists come to the United States from all parts of the world. And many of you perhaps are first generation. Many of you perhaps are immigrants and still are very close to the traditions. It's important to acknowledge and recognize that in times of crises, we can draw from the legacies, the stories, the his and her stories of our elders and ancestors and transform our fears into opportunities. So I invite you to think about where you draw your strength to continue to be a scholar, to be a mentor, to be a professor, to be a supervisor, to be that staff support person that keeps the department going and keeps the faculty sane and who sometimes may be invisible and we forget to thank you and we forget to acknowledge you and we forget to celebrate you. I invite you to reflect on what is available to us. What stories do you have? What stories do you carry? 
And sometimes I reflect on my mother who at the age of 50 migrated to the United States with me to join my father who had previously migrated at the age of 45 to the United States. And how my mother loved her adult sons, her extended family, my father's extended family, that which was familiar and was willing to come to the United States so that her daughter, I, could have an easier life, a better education. And I think about her years of loneliness and isolation when I went away to school and she didn't have too many friends. She had a neighbor who was a lovely Russian lady who shared with her the experience of immigration to the United States, although at a much younger age. And I think about how when I was working on my master's degree, a group of women came and gave a talk on re-entry to college of adult women. And this light bulb turned on in my head and I ran home and I told my mother, you are going to go to college. My mother had been a teacher in her country but she could not work in the United States. She didn't speak English well enough and she wasn't credentialed here. And I said, you're gonna go to college. And my mother said, no, I'm too old. By this time, my mother was in her 60s. And so we lived literally across the street from LA City College in the San Fernando Valley and in California. And so I literally took her by the hand just as she had taken me when I was a little girl to go to school for the first time. And I took my mother by the hand and we walked to the admissions office of the junior college. And I said, my mother would like to enroll. And my mother the whole time kept saying, I'm too old, I'm too old, I'm too old. And I began to pray, oh God, please send some old lady in um, with a cane, my ageism present at age 26. And so that my mother can see that she's not that old. And suddenly a group of older ladies walked by and looked at my mother and smiled. And I thanked the creator and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I enrolled my mother and I obtained my doctorate in May of 1982. And the day before my graduation, my mother obtained her AA degree. And I didn't think anything of it because I had been in school my entire life. I was 28 years old and I had a PhD. My mother was 67 and she had obtained an AA degree. So when I feel sorry for myself and when I'm having my own little pity party about all the things that I cannot do, I think about my mother and I think about her journey in this country, her educational journey in this country. 40 years after she had completed her studies in her native country, she obtained an AA degree in child development. Not with the intention of working necessarily, but it, with the intention of maintaining her brain active. And she found a community of other women who had gone back to school after their husbands retired and they needed to get away from home because their husbands were driving them crazy. And so she, my mother found a support system that she didn't have prior to that particular moment. Next slide, please. So I invite you to think about your practice because our cultural traditions offer us ways of balancing and healing, maybe prayer, smudging, ancestor worship, meditation, yoga, mindfulness. But we know we can also promote mental, emotional, physical balance through exercise, through baking and cooking, reaching out to others, through action and activism, but also through isolating. Sometimes we just need to take time. One of the things that I try to do is go on drives. Um, because my daughter's a nurse and because I'm high risk, my daughter doesn't let me out of the house much. 
but I get in the car and I drive to the Berkeley Marina and I just look at the ocean. Sometimes if there is nobody around, I get out and I walk. A lot of the time there are people running around without a mask. So I get very angry and stressed out. And then I do my breathing and my meditation in the car, listening to the sound of the ocean. What is your practice? Whatever it is, we have to do a lot more of it and to do it regularly. Next slide, please. I would like you to, in a few minutes, to, if you like, write a word or short phrase in the text that reflect your wishes for yourself and for those of us who are here virtually connected. And again, these are difficult times. It's important to be present. It's important to check in with ourselves, identify how we're doing, how we're feeling, how we are acting, what our thoughts are in order to be able to seek balance, to stay in balance, to recalibrate, if you will. It's as if when you go to the lab, you have to check your equipment. You have to make everything is running smoothly. We need to do that with ourselves. We need to do that with our bodies, with our minds, with our hearts. Next slide, please. This is my happy place. I was born in the Caribbean. This is actually the Pacific coast of Oaxaca, but it's an ocean. And so this is where I go in my mind when I'm cold, when I'm stressed, when I'm sad, when I'm anxious, when I'm fearful, when I'm apprehensive, and when I'm happy. And I wanna leave this image with you. I wanna share my happy place with you because you've been kind enough to share your time and your patience with us this morning. It is important to recognize that each of us has value, that each of us deserves to be where we are, that each of us deserves to be successful, and that each of us deserves to have balance and peace in our lives. And that our institutions need to be reminded that we have worth and we have value and that we're all in this together. And that in order to continue to thrive during these very challenging times, we need to have above all patience, gratitude and compassion. Compassion for ourselves because we may not be performing at our best. It is not possible right now. Next slide, please. And lastly, again, I want to thank all the organizers, in particular, Pam and Simi for allaying my anxieties about this particular platform. I am honored to have shared this time with you. Here is my contact information if you would like to reach later. And now I'll turn it over to Ms. Grewell to take us into our next activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. That was an amazing. Oh, thank you. Presentation. That, that was, I, I, I think I already felt my pulse drop a little bit. <laughs> I all the anxieties and everything, and everything was just so relatable. And I think our audience will also find the same too. And I hope this did help you. And for now, we are now going to open up the platform to ask questions. There's a comment by Myra Castro. She says, thank you so much for sharing your personal experience and all of your advice. I wish all of us to be capable of getting deep down on ourselves and to recognize our fears as well as our values. Thank you. 
Also, if you guys want to speak, please remember to raise your hands in order to speak, if you would like to. I too have a question. Um, for those of us who may or may not know our family history as much, and some of us who are might be embarrassed to ask about some of our family history, how do we bring this up, especially for those of us who haven't who haven't bothered to ask some of our family members? Well, I think we have the advantage that we're researchers, right? And so <laughs> you can um, maybe ask other people who are not in your family. Uh, you can do a bit of research about what are the traditions from the particular community where your family originates. And this is very important because I think for many of us who are immigrants and particularly for those of us who may have had challenging migrations, um, talking about the past is not something that we may feel comfortable doing. Um, and so I think we can begin by sharing our experience sometimes with our families and saying, you know, I just read about this or I just heard about this and I'm wondering if this is something that our family practiced back in fill in the blank. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, most of us attending today are students or postdocs and power dynamics in academia can be harmful. How can we hold those in positions of power in academia accountable for contributing to toxic and traumatic environments for students, especially when those in power are often responsible for our career progress? This is probably the most challenging. And I have to tell you, when we were interviewing uh, STEM scholars, the stories were gut-wrenching and infuriating. And I think this is where building community is so important. Um, many of the um, graduate students on our campus who were um, women of color found that they needed to form student organizations, graduate student organizations. And they had, you know, the Latina graduate student organization, African-American, et cetera. And they collectively would advocate. But also what happened during the, um, the grant that we had, as we were interviewing women, even though, you know, we were supposed to be objective researchers, I became so incensed by many of the things that I was hearing as I did my colleagues that we went straight to the PI who was chancellor at the time and said, this is what we're hearing. And the change sometimes has to come from the top, right? It may be mobilized from the bottom, but it has to come from both sources. And so she in turn would have meetings with deans who in turn would have meetings with faculty members. But we felt very concerned about protecting the graduate students. And in some instances, what we advised was finding alternative um, mentors. We found that most of the STEM scholars, the female STEM scholars who were successful actually had uh, multiple mentors inside and outside their department and had advocates outside the department. And it's a delicate balance because as a graduate student, you are dependent on these individuals. And I think it's important to build community, have community and to have agency and use your voice and denounce as, as, as scary as it is and as threatening as it is, find allies. You know, when I was a graduate student, I had the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund on speed dial. You know, I brought the Office of Civil Rights into my department as a graduate student. I didn't realize that that was to a large extent insane <laughs> because I was just so incensed about how I was being treated and how some of my classmates were being treated. It was an extremely toxic environment. And you know, to this day, I tell students if they want, if they are applying to graduate school in that particular university in that particular department, not to use my name, that it would not be good for me to write a letter for them. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, I don't know if awesome. it's out, but you have to build a community and you have to find allies. And yeah. their allies are out there. Sometimes they're very quiet and they work behind the scenes. Um, sorry. Yes. So our, our next question, um, I can reflect on most of the things you commented. I was feeling like I might be the one feeling this down. Thanks for sharing. We all human, human and we're feeling down during these uncertain times than what is normal. I believe we need to reach out for help despite the stigma that is attached to some of these experiences in the form of mental illness. I agree. And you know, one of the things that I'm proud of the state of California is that um, we have a Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, it's an African American pediatrician who is one of the people who has brought the adverse experiences in childhood um, to the forefront and who's participated in a number of research studies. Uh, she actually has a number of toolkits that are on the um, California COVID-19 website about how to deal with the pandemic and how to destigmatize everything that we're feeling. And so I think, again, when you have from the leadership at the top, um, encouraging people to reach out and normalizing what the distress that we're all experiencing, I think that's very critical. Again, um, um, Nadine Burke Harris, she actually has a TED talk that I encourage everyone to listen to. Um, and it's um, childhood trauma on childhood trauma and how it impacts. Yes, I will, I will, uh, I will write the name here in the in the chat. Um, I think one of the critical issues to remember is that for us who are immigrants or who come from cultures where seeking mental health support is not customary or is highly stigmatized, it's important to remember that one of the positive things about being bi or multicultural is that you can draw the strengths from all the cultures that you embody or that you represent or that you interact with. And finding psychological, emotional, behavioral health support is not as stigmatized in the United States. Of course, this very much depends on social class and level of education, but we can draw from the resources that are available. And our universities, for the most part, have mental health resources available. I'm finding that I have to triage students. They, they wanna talk to me because they trust me, I'm their professor. And because in this virtual classroom that we now have, you know, they, they, they don't have to show themselves. <laughs> they have their cameras off, which is very disconcerting. And so I will say, well, why don't you talk to so-and-so in the student health center? Because I can't be therapist to my students, right? But I can try to facilitate that. And uh, there's an important question uh, from the audience about how to encourage our colleagues to slow down too. I'm finding that because I'm an elder, uh, some of the younger faculty actually listen to me, which is great because my family often doesn't. So <laughs> to have somebody listening to me is quite refreshing. And particularly the early career um, and tenured faculty who have children and who are doing homeschooling, it's like, breathe, it's okay. Our university, again, has basically said, we're not counting this year. If you wanna wait another year to go out for tenure, that's fine. We're not gonna hold it against you. This basically 2020 is not gonna exist in the merit <laughs> and promotion packets if we so choose. If people wanna go up, so be it. And so encouraging them, and I think this falls on the senior faculty, for those of us who actually have junior colleagues that are 
that talk to us and are not afraid of us, that to encourage them, to, to tell them it's okay, that we value what they're doing and we recognize the tremendous burden of trying to be an elementary school teacher as you're trying to move forward in your career. But again, I think it also needs to come from our department chairs, our deans, our academic provosts, our chancellors. And fortunately in our campus, it is happening. I completely agree. Um, it, it, and it goes back to the comment that you said before, it starts from the bottom and goes down. Positivity. Um, I, I believe uh, the other organizers that were also part of this as well, we came up with the term and it's called trickle down toxicity yes. and how it starts from the beginning and then it just goes down, down the movement. And so we have to make sure that we stop that first and then start and then also make sure that we start with positive feelings all the way from the top and also from the bottom. That way, eventually something hits the middle. Excuse me for being a scientist in this. <laughs> oh, no, no, by all means. <laughs> Embrace who you are. Um, but I think it's also important that we need to survive this, particularly those of us who are in very toxic environments, in order to change the culture. Yes. The culture has to be changed. And at the risk of sounding very sexist, and I apologize beforehand if I offend anyone, is that the science culture began as a very masculine patriarchal context, highly competitive. And in order to thrive within it, women had to embody some of those practices. And this is what early feminists called the queen bee syndrome. You know, that just because you're a female doesn't mean you're not going to be toxic as a, as a leader, as a PI. And so we all need to do, I think, a lot of soul searching for those of us who've been around a lot longer. And for graduate students and, and early career scholars, it's, we need to be held accountable and build a community, get a network of support and hold us accountable. Call us on our unfair practices and go above us and, and you know, complain and change the culture once you become a faculty member. You know, one of the things that inspires me is how you know, some of my junior colleagues really go all out to embrace the diversity of students that are really teaching us about how to be responsive to a more diverse student body than we've ever had before. And I think this is where a lot of international scholars can also help us understand the rest of the world because the United States tends to be less understanding of the rest of the world. And so we need to learn from each other. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from the audience. Mm -hmm. How can we set boundaries when the people around you have expe expectations that aren't consistent with reality? Again, this is where you speak truth to power. You know, <laughs> these are not normal times and it's okay to, to remind people who are hierarchically above you. These are not normal times. My situation is the following. And I think also for a lot of um, STEM scholars who don't have wives at home, that whether you're male or female, that you know, parenting in the 21st century is different than it was in the early 20th century or even the mid 20th century when some of um, the more senior colleagues were uh, being trained. And so, you have multiple roles that you're performing and they all deserve equal attention. And the reality is, you know, that as a grandmother, I can shut my door and focus on what I have to do, but my daughter can't. And we need to understand that we're all in different places in terms of our life cycle and the responsibilities that we have. 
and that if I'm the PI, I can delegate lots of things. And if I'm graduate student, maybe I can delegate to an undergrad I'm training, but I'm, I'm it. <laughs> and the junior faculty, you know, the untenured faculty are having to survive has been stated in some climates that are very toxic. And, and again, find the allies because not everybody participates in a culture of toxic, toxicity. So you have to find the people who don't, who have more power in the institution than you do and they can advocate on your behalf. And if you have a chair that is willing to listen and is amenable, have them help you. Right. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How can we set boundaries when the people around you have expectations that aren't consistent with real? Oh, sorry. That was something I already read. Sorry. <laughs> um, how can we know it's the time for seeking professional help? When everything that you're doing is still not helping you self-regulate uh, or get to a baseline of emotion, thought, behavior that is helpful for you. Frankly, I think that whenever we enter a, a post-active pandemic stage, 90% of us are gonna need to be in therapy, at least short term because reintegrating into whatever normality is going to be present after we can leave our homes or after the vaccine or after whatever comes next, um, we're going to need a reset. You know, some people are saying we're not going to be back to normal till 2022. Frankly, I don't think we'll ever be back to normal. And I think for, for, for those of us who who are scientists and like to read, probably studying the 1918 pandemic might be helpful. You know, how did people adjust? What happened afterwards? And I think we need to continue to normalize the fact that we are going to need support. And as a practicing mental health provider, I'm talking to other mental health providers and we really are talking about how we need to reestablish for those of us who haven't had them, our consultation group so we can support each other, so we can support other people because we're also be, having this experience. It's not like, well, I'm a psychologist or a psychiatrist and I've never had anxiety or depression. Therefore, I can treat somebody who has anxiety or depression. No, we can treat because we know it, because we've experienced it. And there was a, a question in the chat about, for those of us who have diagnosed mental illness, do we disclose or not? Um, and I, th I think this is a, a really tough question because I think it's like any identity that we have, whether it's our sexuality, whether it's our ethnicity or race, for those of us who can pass as something but are multiracial, for example, we need to be true to ourselves. And if a diagnosis we carry, it's something we have, it's not something we are. I think this is a very important disti distinction. I have anxiety, I am not anxiety. I have depression, I am not depression. I have diabetes, I am not diabetes. Whatever your diagnosis is, it's something you have. It's not something you are, but it's something you negotiate. So it is a challenge, you know? For some of us, we may have a learning disability, a learning difference, have dyslexia, um, you know? So have depression, have anxiety, have bipolar disorder. It's part of what you have to navigate. So if it's important for you to disclose it, disclose it. And it, it, there may be repercussions. And again, so I think trying to figure out who is safe you know, some of the, the Quiet Mind is a wonderful book and I, right now I can't access the, the file in my brain where the author's name is stored, um, but it's a psychiatrist who has bipolar disorder. You know, I assigned this book to, in my mental health class all the time. So, um, and it's very liberating and it was very liberating for her to write this book. 
you know, trying to come out of the shadows, trying to come out of hiding. Yes, an unquiet mind. Thank you. A memoir of moods and madness. K. Redfield Jamison. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yes. And if I might also add to those of you who do have disabilities, whether they're seen or unseen, it is very important to understand that you're not alone. And especially in the sciences, we tend not to disclose any of this. If it's, any, if it's heartening to anybody, I suffer from auditory processing disorder. It means that as a child, I didn't learn how to talk until I was six. And when it did come out, it came out backwards. It meant that I had to go through several speech therapies. I had to go through several different things and seeing the present elect who has a stutter was representative. And I implore many of you, many of you who do see, who do see their disability as a, as something to, to be ashamed of, look at leaders who have gone through, who have the same sort of thing and who are now moving forward and, and see how people across the globe love them still and think that they're amazing. So please see that. Yes. Thank you. That's excellent. Excellent. Also, um, there's a, another question. It seems like a fundamental challenge in changing what we optimize for. If we optimize for results at all costs, we encourage very harmful behavior. How do we encourage scientists that they can still be good scientists, even if they choose to prioritize their health and balance instead of results at all costs? I am very hopeful that having um, the leadership that I think we're going to have beginning in January, that we can humanize a lot of the institutes and a lot of the funding sources. I think this will take time. But again, I grew up, I'm part of that generation that grew up with the motto that the revolution begins at home. If it were not for graduate students, many of us could not get our work done and we could not advance in our careers. So I think graduate students often do not realize the potential power that they have, again, if it's done in a collective way. So I think if you begin by setting those boundaries yourself and by having compassionate, kind and respectful conversations with those who uh, are in positions of power or authority over you, that you can begin to educate and you can do it from the perspective of science, that we need to change the culture and it's gonna have to begin with you. Uh, and the allies who share your vision and who re re realize in retrospect that they sacrificed a lot, that they sacrificed their health, maybe they sacrificed having a family because they thought it was incompatible with being a scientist, which we heard from many women STEM scholars during our research, that it doesn't have to be that way, that we don't have to perpetuate and replicate oppressive patterns. And I know that I am placing the burden on you um, largely, but I also wanna remind you that you're not alone in this, that you will have allies in the academy. It's a matter of finding it. Um, yeah, one to two weeks of vacation per year is not sustainable. Um, and again, it's use your data, you know, you're a scientist do the research, prove, show, demonstrate scientifically that these particular practices are toxic. If we don't disclose the distress that we experience, the institution doesn't know. At the time that we were doing the advance grant, the, the vice provost for academic affairs was the same scientist. And some of the graduate students we interviewed that had had horrific experiences were from her department. She had no idea. She was horrified. She was ashamed. But nobody ever told her. 
nobody ever told her, nobody ever approached her and said, this is going on. And she was and would have been a tremendous advocate. The day she announced she was retiring, many of us were in deep grief and mourning because we felt we were never gonna have that kind of support again. But we didn't know it. And I knew it because I met with her weekly in, in, in meetings. And so when I began to hear from the graduate students, I was equally horrified because she would have been an ally, but they didn't know. And so I think we also need to get out of our silos and meet people, meet people, meet the folks in power and, and check them out. You know, how open are they to hearing these kinds of feedbacks? We can't assume that because they are administrators, they don't have our back. We can't assume that they do, we have to assess it. So then in that case, how do we make them more accountable? Especially those of us who are just starting out. Mm -hmm. You know, I assume those who are a graduate student, postdoc or early career, or those who are hoping to attempt to get tenure. Often yeah. people feel so marginalized that they speak out, there's often repercussions for speaking out mm -hmm. or trying to change the system. There right. always is. And that's a reality. And I think that's why sometimes you need to go outside the department and find individuals who might be allies and advocates outside the department that can have influence. But you can't, you really can't do it alone. And one of the things that many of our graduate students were very good at doing was to finding, especially for the, the students of color and the international students, was to find a white United Station that could speak on their behalf and could bring the issues to the table. And typically um, a white male colleague that was highly regarded and respected, but who shared their views and who was concerned about their well being and who would raise these issues as something he had observed that he had concerned about. And again, I think number one is you need, you need to understand your institution and who the people are in there. And, and, and what are the, the channels that one can follow? There are always the ombudsperson that I, in our campus have been very helpful to advocate on behalf of particular students who are feeling or experiencing a great deal of marginalization in their departments or with, in their labs or with their PIs. So the university has these resources. I think we need to explore them and we need to use them and, and check them out to see if they actually are doing what they're intended to do, what they are meant to do in terms of supporting individuals who are more disempowered by the institution itself. So say if a graduate student um, recognizes that there are, there are problems, right? And they want to start building a community. Should they, should they start at the top? Should they start at the bottom? Should they start somewhere in the middle? You know, should they, you know, almost create analysis, almost bring about, like, <laughs> almost do a scientific analysis, polling situation, signing papers, you know, make this actionable almost. Yeah, I think so. I think all of the above. I think find community. So if you're an international student, the Office of International Affairs would be a good place to begin. Who else is there? Who else is experiencing? You know, talk to the staff. Um, our global affairs office is tremendous. I mean, I've gotten calls from them saying, or students have had an experience of a student actually from Mexico who was sort of lost <laughs> and literally standing in, in, in the middle of the, of the global affairs office. And, and one of the advisors came out and said, hello, and said, can I help you? And he said, I just don't know what to do. I'm here as a, as a visiting student from, from Mexico and I'm, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. And so she brought him into his office and gave him the rundown of what their office did. And then said, oh, you know, you might wanna to talk to Professor Flores in Chicano studies because she does a lot of work in Mexico. So here he appears in my office, right? 
<laughs> and so, um, and he was an engineering student. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to ask somebody and then you get connected. And so, you know, we connected him to all kinds of resources on campus so that he could get his needs met, which he was not getting met in his engineering classes. But part of it was he felt very uncomfortable with his English. So he was too shy to go talk to the professor. And so, you know, I called the professor and I said, look, you have the student, blah, blah, blah. And said, oh, send him to my office, have him come to me. You know, so sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it's a lot more complicated. Do we have, it seems as if um, much of the questions have stopped. Um, oh, nope, we have another one. Here it comes. Uh, it seems like a fundamental challenge is changing what we optimize for. Yeah. If we optimize for results at all costs, we encourage very harmful behavior. How do we encourage scientists that they can still be good scientists, even if they choose to prioritize their health and balance instead of results at all costs. And I think one of the things that um, we need to do is we need to be better at sharing information about the science culture, the cost to uh, focusing on producing at all costs, um, the lack of balance in our lives. Um, at the risk of you know self promotion, which I'm really not intending to do, our advanced grant uh, is in the final stages of uh, publishing a book that actually recounts how we went about this grant, all the initiatives that the university um, had to support women in science and Latinas in particular in this case. And that includes uh, our chapters from the social science research team about the particular experiences, you know, because <laughs> the editors of the book are all scientists. This has gone through like 15 rewrites. I am not exaggerating. And oh the editors, <laughs> because it has to be perfect, right? <laughs> <laughs> As a psychologist, three, three editions ago, I was like, this is good enough. No, we have to check it one more time. So I think, you know, that reflects what, what the question is speaking about. So I think we, there's, a, there's also the um, Understanding Interventions Conference that I participated over many years, which I strongly recommend because this is one of the places where scientists and social scientists get together. And a lot of the narratives that inform my thinking about how we need to change the academy and science culture come from the narratives and disclosures at that place um, where people feel comfortable you know, sharing their experience. So if any of you have not participated in that conference, I encourage you to go um, because it's an opportunity for people to share social science data with STEM experiences to the benefit of, of both. Um, yes, thank you. There is the, 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 the site uh, in the chat for those of you who are interested. Because I think we need to be able to quantify the costs, because you're scientists, you need quantification, of the cost of focusing on production to a much greater extent than well-being. I think we need actuar actuarial data. The scientists on our campus don't live very long. This is something that concerns me as a health scholar. Um, you know, one of the, the deans that we had for many years from, um, um, you know, mathematical, mathematics and physical sciences, MPS, um, retired and died within three years. And he seemed to be a very healthy man and I was quite perplexed and his you know, lifelong assistant said, oh, he smoked three packs a day. You know, that's how he kept going. He was always smoking and we couldn't smoke on campus. You know, Davis has a, no, you can't smoke in the city of Davis. And so he found a way to be able to smoke that nobody noticed because <laughs> nobody ever saw him smoke. So, you know, but he was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers. And so what's the point when, you know, you, 
retire at 62 and are dead at 65. So I think we need these kinds of data to, to say, you know, our way of working and our focus on producing knowledge is killing us. And I hope and pray that the graduate students here in the audience and early career individuals are going to change that culture for themselves and force the rest of us to tag along. It's a tall order and I don't wanna burden you more than you already are, but I really do think it's critical that you exercise your agency and your voice and find those allies who will support you. And Professor Flores, we can also see that with, with the polling. We, we've gotten some of the early, some of the results of it. And a lot of them said they had a lot of stress before the pandemic. pandemic. Yeah. And then it's increasing during it as well. Yeah. You know, these, these, these individuals were already suffering and now we're just adding fuel to the fire. That's yeah. what it seems like. Yeah. <clears throat> and they said that it seems like even though they are receiving support, it's, it's not necessarily that bad, which doesn't necessarily mean it's that good in a way. Um, but yeah, it it seems it's 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 really is something. Oh, we have another question. Um, what are some things we can do day to day to disassemble and challenge the nose to the crying store or I suffered, therefore you should suffer mentality slash culture of graduate school. Resist, <laughs> resist, rebel, be subversive. <laughs> no, nobody needs to know what you're doing at home, how you're balancing your time. And so, yeah, there are only 24 hours in a day and hopefully you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep. So in the 16 remaining hours, you can afford 30 minutes for self-care. It sometimes is an issue of time management, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, yeah, I reward myself on Sundays by watching Netflix. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> do I. <laughs> I, have, I have to, uh, or, you know, fear the walking dead because I want to think about the future, uh, <laughs> that it could be worse. <laughs> and, and so, and then, you know, I have a tall stack of books that will be my reward for whenever I get caught up with work. But um, I think thinking about putting yourself in the I in the equation, I am important, I am worthy, I am going to take care of me for half an hour today because the grindstone will always be there. Mm -hmm. And also acknowledging that mental, mental health is so important. It is, I would even put it as higher regard than physical health because your physical health does not improve until your mental health improves first. A lot of addicts you'll talk to, once the mental once you always see it on these programs, I don't know if you watched this, my, my 600 pound life, I, I'm addicted to that show. And um, it's always interesting. These individuals do not start losing weight properly and in full until they finally reach a therapist or any other show where you watch addicts. Mm -hmm. It's until they reach that, they can finally do that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I also like to mention to many of our viewers about some resources that are under the files tab. So if you go into the files tab, there's a resources that you can also go to for that. Um, yes, you know, I, it's a great list of resources. Uh, and you know, one of the things that, um, that I wanna underscore is that if you're feeling mentally saturated because your nose has been to the grindstone, you're not going to work as effectively. If you take a half hour break, go for a walk, have a quick run, make yourself a healthy lunch, you know, talk to a friend, do your stretches, do your yoga, you're going to be able to get back to the grindstone with a lot more energy. You have to rest your mind. So whatever rest your mind, so that you feel less saturated. The pile of things to do is always gonna be growing 
and laugh. It's like, yes, it reproduces overnight somehow. You know, I had three yesterday and now there are six letters I'm supposed to write. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Let's see which one is most urgent. <laughs> you know, you have to have humor. One of the 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 schools of therapy, if you will, that 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 I ascribe to is is uh, from a group down under in New Zealand, and they very influenced by you know Aboriginal and Maori philosophy, and they talk about you have to have a good laugh at least once a day. I thought. And some of us, we have to have a good cry at least once a day. Yeah. <laughs> then, okay, cleanse and tears, on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much, Professor Flores, for giving this talk, for providing, providing so much help and hope and acknowledgement of our mental issues during this time of COVID. I would also like to thank the organizers uh, Julia, Eddie, Don Don, Araceli, Daniel, Rachel, and Eva for helping us organize this. And finally, also Pam for doing so much for us. I also ask the, the audience to please uh, fill out the survey. You can um, also, we ask you to attend, to fill out the attendee survey as well, which should be under the files tab to let us know how the session met your expectations and suggest other topics that the Student Engagement Subcommittee could address in the future. I conclude this meeting and I ask that all of you guys have a wonderful and blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.